Last week I mentioned to you that we would be starting a new series this Sunday, and we are. And it is found in the little book of First Thessalonians. It's very small, only has five brief chapters. I gave you some homework. I don't know if you remember or not. Acts chapter 17 gives you the, the beginning of the church. And uh, today we are going to try to cover the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians, do the best we can. And I've entitled this A Church Worth Joining. Uh, Someone, uh, a famous preacher, still has uh, a radio program called Love Worth Finding. And uh, this is a, a church worth joining today. Now, to give you some bit of background is uh, some video that we're going to show you. Uh, This, uh, the first one is, um, talks a little bit about the history of Thessalonica, and then you'll see some of the few archaeological things that have been unearthed there. The reason why archaeologists are not able to do much there is because this is a continuing habited city. Uh, it's, it's a large city today. It has been through the, through the years. This city goes back to about uh, 300 B.C. So this one has been around a long time, but you'll notice modern buildings. So archaeologists can't just take a shovel and start digging around there. That's uh, something you can't do. So anyway, there are two videos. The first one uh, is about three minutes, and the second one is about two minutes. So watch the screen. Thessalonica was founded in 315 B.C. by Cassander, and he named Thessalonica after his wife. The modern city is second only to Athens in size. In 1963, they broke ground for new law courts and discovered ruins from the 2nd and 3rd century A.D. and began excavation. And as is obvious here, this one square block area is surrounded by the bustling city. And no doubt, there are other ruins underneath these new buildings. The Aegean Sea is a short walk from the excavation site. Upon leaving Philippi on the second missionary journey, Paul and Silas traveled to Thessalonica, a walk of over 95 miles. Paul wrote that he worked night and day in Thessalonica to support himself and his companions. And in Philippians 4.16, he says he needed additional income which was provided more than once by the church at Philippi. This would indicate that Paul probably remained in Thessalonica for weeks, if not months. The Jewish community was angry at his success at converting their members, and they also feared the local officials would renounce their favored status and therefore his friends that very night whisked him out of the city to a safer place, Berea. Once again, we took advantage of this location for another teaching session by Pastor Dave. The large open area is the ancient Agora of Hellenistic times from the 3rd century BC. After the 1st century AD, the Romans used the same area for their forum, which was their marketplace, their meeting place, and administrative center. You could see the bases for columns and a few remaining columns, which would have supported a roof over those areas around the forum. A section of underground shops also is being excavated. They have also discovered a complex with baths for therapeutic bathing with both hot and cold pools 
and a furnace room alongside. The ancient city of Thessalonica was an important seaport in the area of Macedonia. It was originally named after the sister of Alexander the Great and was at the crossroads of four major highways. In 146 BC, Macedonia was made into a Roman province and Thessalonica was established as its capital. The city gained even more prominence in 42 BC by helping Mark Antony and Octavian defeat the remaining assassins of Julius Caesar. In the first century AD, the Book of Acts records a visit to Thessalonica by the Apostle Paul. And later, Paul himself writes letters to the believers in Thessalonica that today are called the biblical books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. This first century city is estimated to have had a population around 100,000. Archaeological remains are hard to come by at Thessalonica due to the city still being actively occupied. However, a large 70 by 110 yard paved Roman style forum has been uncovered, dating from the first and second centuries AD. Also, it is known that a first century Roman archway called the Vandar Arch survived in Thessalonica until 1867, when it was finally taken down. Today, an inscription from the archway survives in the British Museum, and this inscription itself helped clear up some controversy regarding the accuracy of the New Testament. In Acts 17, the author Luke mentions the city officials of Thessalonica using a previously unknown Greek term. It just so happens that the inscription from this destroyed archway also refers to the officials of Thessalonica using this exact Greek term. I know that's brief, but uh, at least it gives you a little bit of understanding of that there were real people living there, they worked, they uh, did school, they, they had, you saw the theater there, they put on plays there of course, and um, it, it was later turned into a gladiator arena. So we're talking about real people and uh, as Paul came into the city along with uh, Silas and Timothy, there had not been a word of Christianity in that city until they showed up. So let's look at it quickly, 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 to 10, and then we'll come back and make a few comments about it. Paul and Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We give thanks always for all of you uh, making uh, uh, mention of you in our prayers constantly. Remembering your work of faith and your labor of love and the endurance of the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before God and our Father. Knowing this, beloved brethren, you are beloved by God, your election because our gospel did not come to you in word alone, but also with power, the Holy Spirit, and with much conviction. Just as you know what kind of people we were among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, receiving the word in much affliction with joy produced by the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For from you, the word of the Lord sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report to us what kind of visit we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols, to serve the living and true God, and to await his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, the one who rescues us 
from the wrath to come. So a church worth joining. You know, today, especially here in the South, that uh, you can all, hardly throw a stone and not hit a church building somewhere. Um, right here in our area, we've got the Methodist church up the street, our church. Go down a little bit more and you pick up Rosemont Baptist and so on. We've got churches all over Niceville. But then this was the it. That was the only place uh, of uh, a Christian group of believers in Thessalonica. But it was still a, a church worth joining. And our church is too. I may be biased, but I'm going to be biased. But uh, what are some marks of a church worth joining? Quickly, here's the first one. It understands who they are. Verse 1, it says to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This word church here, uh, prior to the time that Paul used it and, and Jesus, it was used to describe an assembly of people. It didn't really matter what kind. It could have been an assembly of brick masons, uh, carpenters, or politicians, or whatever. It was just a group of people called together for some kind of purpose. But the Christians seized upon this word to describe that they had been called out of the world into a new group, people who confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, and they were the church, the gathering of people who were called out of the world and into uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, a church who understands who they are involves two things. One, a natural identity, and then a spiritual identity. The natural identity is, and we can put it in a nutshell, for us is we are a medium-sized Southern Baptist church in the panhandle of Florida. Basic, pretty basic location. If you want to make it even closer, we would say a mid-sized Southern Baptist church in the panhandle of Florida, specifically in Niceville. That would be our natural identity. But Paul doesn't dwell so much on the natural identity, but as the spiritual identity. He says several things here, that they have been created by God and Jesus Christ. This word in God can be translated with by or it can mean in. And if it's by, it's their creation of a group of people to follow uh, Jesus or it can be in God. That is, in where our, our environment is within God and Jesus Christ. We draw our life from both of them. Jesus is described as the head of the church and God is the father. So our spiritual identity is in God. That means God is in our church and Jesus is the head of it. Man, that's awesome to realize that uh, God is in us as we are in him. And he says we're beloved. In verse four, we're beloved and we're elect. Now, this, this has caused so much controversy for people and have taken it one way or the other, but it's essentially an Old Testament concept. And let me read it to you. It comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. And here's what it says. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. To be beloved by God and to be elect means that you have been brought into and a part of a new family. And God has chosen to set his love on this people. You are beloved people. You have been elect because, not because we're a great number of people or because we have a lot of education or our backgrounds or anything like that. It's simply because of God's love. God loves us. 
and he's proved it by the sending, <coughs> excuse me, of his son. Now that's, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to get it out eventually. His love, <coughs> excuse me, is never separated from our response to him. Notice in verse four, it says, knowing beloved brethren, by God, your election. Notice the next few words, because our gospel. You'll never find in the Bible a real separation very far from the idea of God's election and our response to the gospel. It's both and, it's not either or. People want to make it either or, and that's where the problems come in. So they stand together. Thank God that he loves you, and thank God you have responded to the gospel. We are in God and in Christ. He goes on to describe God as living and true in verse 9, and then he says that Jesus is God's son in verse 10, and talks about his resurrection, which includes his death. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 10, he rescues us from the wrath to come. So, yes, we need to understand who we are naturally, our natural identity, but deeper yet is our spiritual identity. Secondly, a church worth joining consists of transformed people. In verses 9 and 10, it says, how you turn to God from idols. I wish we had time to do more background study of this city because it had, along with many other ancient cities, an untold number of gods and goddesses that they worshiped. There were bukus of them. And uh, they believed that they were controlling their life. And so they would pay allegiance to them. Sometimes they would bring food and leave it at the bottom of the, the statue and so on. Paul says, this God that we're talking about is the living and true God. And they turned away from their idols and turned towards God. That is, they broke with their past. Transformed people are people who have broken with their past. Their mistakes, their sins, their disappointments. The, perhaps they had things done to them, but they have broken with their past. Transformed people are not perfect people. They are forgiven people. And we extend that forgiveness to others. So they broke with their past, and they have found service better than selfishness. Notice it says they turned, from, uh, turned to God from their idols to serve God, to serve him. Transformed people understand this. They find service better is better than selfishness. One example that you heard from this morning is our tutoring ministry at Edge Elementary. These people that are doing this could do many other things with their time, but they have decided this is going to be a part of their ministry. And so they're doing that. They have found that service is better than selfishness. And then our orientation is toward the future. We are awaiting something. We're not just meeting here just to pass time. We are looking forward. Christians and the church are people who are looking forward. We are looking forward to the day when Jesus Christ will return. And it may not be tomorrow, it may not be next week, but it could be today, it could be tonight. We don't know, but we're looking forward to that when God is gonna make all things new. So a church worth joining consists of transformed people, not perfect people, forgiven people. Number three, a church worth joining practices spiritual values. Notice in verse three, he mentions three of them, faith, hope, and love. Remembering your work of faith, your labor of love, and the endurance of hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. Work produced by faith. Faith, if there's real faith, will issue in some kind of work or deed or ministry. And it's produced by faith. Just over the last few years here in our church, we have been witnessing an act of faith on our part. 
We uh, had a plan to update our facilities and to build a new children's building and then to renovate our adult space, which we're soon going to, to, be in, uh, to get into. But you know, that came up to about uh, $6 million. And you know, when we thought about that, we thought, oh boy, that's, that's, that's heavy. We're not a church of wealthy people. We're not. We're just regular folk here at First Baptist Niceville. But God has been doing a work in us because of our faith. We raised over $2 million over and above our regular tithes and offerings in a short period of time. And we signed a loan for the rest of it, $3.5 million, which we will start paying monthly, about $21,000 a month on that loan. But God is doing this through our faith through a work of our faith, the labor of love. Well, did you know that every Sunday, every Sunday we have groups, teams from our church that go and minister to nursing homes every Sunday afternoon while some of us are watching football games or going to the beach or whatever. Many of our people are fanned out across the city doing things like that. That's a labor. That's intensive work produced by love. And tomorrow, you're going to see an outpouring of love from First Baptist Church Niceville to the Carol Wise family. You're going to see that in action. It's an amazing thing to see. Labor produced by love. And endurance produced by hope. This word, endurance, means to stand up under pressure. Whatever pressure is being brought, it's the ability to stand up under it. You know, our church is 107 years old this year, 107 years old. Some churches don't make it past three years. Some don't make it past 10 years. But the endurance that God has produced, hope has produced from that little group up in Defuniac Springs who said the people down here on Boggy Bayou, they need a church. And a few of them came down here and got it started. Started out with a Sunday school. And then they had a preacher to walk from Defuniac Springs. Walk, mind you. Every Saturday, preach on Sunday and walk back so he could go to work on Monday. That's the kind of endurance that this church has experienced through the years. It comes from hope. Faith, hope, and and love. A church worth joining practices spiritual values. And then finally in verse 8, he says, from you, you, this little group in Thessalonica that we just saw on the screen, sound has sounded forth the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place. This word sound forth has the idea of a trumpet to it. But we get our English word echo from this Greek word. Have you ever spoken into an echo canyon or something like that? When you speak into a thing like that, what comes back to you? The same thing you spoke into it. It's an echo. It bounces back. And Paul said this, the gospel came to them. They welcomed it in verse 6. And then in verse 8, they echoed it. They kept sounding it forth. And we are too. Just recently, one of our members shared with me that uh, at work, one of their colleagues came up to them one day recently and said, you know, I've been watching you. And uh, I've got a problem in my family. Could I talk with you about it? And they said, sure. Sure. And they had about 20 minutes with that person to be able to listen to them and then share the love of Christ with that person. That's echoing the gospel. Right now, this weekend, our ACT teens are up in Montgomery, Alabama at a place called Children's Harbor. It's a place for children with serious, serious illnesses. And it's a place where they can come and their families can relax and have some fun. Our acting girls are there this weekend 
to help to work with those children and to share the love of Christ with them. Our deacons are visiting in homes throughout our community over the next couple of weeks. We have right now four men in seminary training to be a pastor or to be a preacher. We have a group going to New Orleans next month to share the gospel with homeless people under bridges there in New Orleans. We have Stephanie Hartness in Nepal. Can you say Katmandu? That's where she is in Nepal, sharing, echoing the love of Jesus. We have Laura Jones who went this summer to Uganda and she is from our church as Stephanie is. She is echoing the gospel in Uganda. Anne-Marie Decker, who grew up in this church when we had buses back in the 60s. She came as a child of this church on the bus and became a Christian. And now she's going to Peru to be an echo of the gospel. The Hamiltons, who were just here recently for a little furlough time, back to Mexico. And they're echoing the gospel in Mexico. This is all coming out of a little community called Boggy Bayou. Who would have ever thought that we are echoing the gospel in countries around the world? I don't know about you. I know I'm biased. You may not be biased, but I'm biased. In fact, if I was 30 years younger, I would put my resume in again to be the pastor of this church. (laughs) But at 67, it's time for a younger man to come along. And I'm so excited about the future of our church. I hope you are. I'm so excited. It's a church worth being a part of. Let's pray together. 